Well, welcome everyone to our webinar today. And um, I'm Wafa El Sauder, and I'm the Global Director for ICAP at Columbia University. And I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, webinar today. Uh, this webinar series is uh, very special and it's a collaboration between ICAP at Columbia and the Herbert Irving um, Comprehensive Cancer Center here at the university. And this is an initiative that we establish in collaboration with the Cancer Center in order to address and tackle uh, what has been recognized as the looming threat of cancer uh, globally. In terms of our webinar today, I invite um, everyone to please uh, put your questions uh, for, to the panelists uh, using the Q&A box. Uh, and you can do so anytime uh, during Dr. Warren's uh, presentation. In addition, if you would please use the chat box to indicate your name and your organization, we would deeply appreciate this. And just to let you know that this webinar, in addition to all of the ICAP uh, sponsored webinars, is being recorded and will be posted uh, as well on our ICAP uh, website. So we will start with a presentation by our uh, keynote speaker today uh, to be followed by the question and answer session. So it gives me great pleasure to briefly introduce Dr. Edith Warren, uh, who is currently the program head of global oncology and professor in clinical research and vaccine and infectious disease divisions at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. That's the institution where he's been there for almost 30 years since he actually started his fellowship in medical oncology early in his career. He's a medical oncologist by training. Now, uh, Dr. Warren is known to in his community as Huti, so we will, I will refer to him as such. And he received his, uh, uh, his undergraduate and graduate degrees and uh, PhD uh, from Harvard University. And he then completed his residency in internal medicine at the Mass General, followed by, of course, training in oncology, as uh, I indicated before. Since 2017, Dr. Warren has served as the head of the global uh, oncology program at the Fred Hutch and the primary uh, focus of which is the operation of a cancer research center located on the campus of the Uganda Cancer Institute in Kampala. And we're very eager uh, to hear from him today on the engagement of his center uh, in global cancer uh, control, prevention, and management. Uh, without further ado, I hand it over to you, Dr. Warren, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Um, so you can please uh, share the screen. Thank you very much, Dr. El Sadr, for that very kind introduction. And I, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. El Sadr and Dr. Nugut of the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center for the opportunity to talk at this uh, very exciting webinar, uh, webinar series. And um, uh, I, I hope to talk for about 45 minutes and then leave about 15 minutes for questions. And uh, before I begin, just let me indicate that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, as Dr. L. Sutter said, the Fred Hutch um, operates 8,800 miles and 11 time zones from Seattle, a freestanding brick and mortar cancer research uh, and training center uh, in Kampala, Uganda on the campus of the Uganda Cancer Institute. And for the past four and a half years, I've had the great honor and pleasure uh, to lead this effort. This is our uh, cancer center in Kampala. If any of you have ever visited the Fred Hutch in Seattle, uh, you'll recognize that uh, it looks just like all of the rest of the buildings on our Seattle campus. And that's uh, not a coincidence. And I'll tell you more about this uh, lovely facility later. Why do we do cancer research abroad? Well, it provides another, uh, a number of uh, important scientific and, uh, and clinical opportunities. It provides us the opportunity to study globally important cancers that are rare or uncommon in the US, particularly infection-related cancers. And I'll speak about a few of those. Examples include pediatric Burkitt lymphoma in Sub-Saharan Africa, Kaposi's sarcoma, and and nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is endemic as, uh, as most of you all know in Southern China and Southeast Asia. 
uh, working abroad also gives us um, um, and responds to a need um, that we see for better understanding of global heterogeneity in the genetics and genomics, as well as the biology of common cancers and, and the genomics of different populations. And we think that's very relevant for the most common epithelial uh, malignancies that uh, account for the great uh, bulk of cancer burden worldwide, such as breast, lung, and, and GI cancers. And, um, and we hope, and this remains something somewhat aspirational, that our studies abroad will lead to reciprocal innovation, uh, i.e. lessons learned abroad will have applicability to cancer care in low resource settings in the US. Um, and as uh, an examples of areas in which that uh, we, we hope that, that will be true, uh, I would uh, offer point of care, low cost diagnostics, and as well as oral chemotherapy regimens. I mentioned pathogen associated cancers. They're very important globally, although perhaps not um, that much in the United States and in high income countries. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, up to 30 to 40% of all cancers are um, really thought to be related uh, in one form or another to infection. And that is one of the major foci of the research that we do in Kampala. I present here my rogues gallery of infectious agents causing cancer, uh, at the top of which uh, are, are two major human pathogens, human papillomavirus that causes at least five different types of cancer, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus, which of course cause liver cancer, Helicobacter pylori associated with gastric cancer, Epstein-Barr virus associated with a number of different malignancies, uh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus associated with KS, Merkel cell, polyomavirus associated with Merkel cell uh, carcinoma, and of course, HIV. We don't think HIV causes cancer per se, but uh, it's very clear that uh, uh, individuals with uh, living with HIV infection are at very increased risk for the development of malignancy. And in addition to the AIDS-defining malignancies of cervical cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and Kaposi sarcoma, the risk of which is increased 570 and greater than 1,000 fold, respectively, by HIV infection. We know that HIV infection is associated with an increased risk for the development of anal cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, and Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as a number of other uh, malignancies. Why do we see this? Uh, that the answer really is uh, incompletely defined. Immune dysregulation in individuals living with HIV is part of the answer. Um, those individuals um, are often co-infected with oncogenic viruses, uh, many of which I just showed you in the previous slide, including Epstein-Barr virus, KSHV, HPV, HPV, and HCV. Uh, there's an uh, increased prevalence of smoking in individuals living with HIV infection, and that's uh, very much true of the HIV popul uh, positive population in the US. And, and aging and immune senes senescence play, uh, play a role uh, in the increased risk of cancer in uh, people living with HIV. Um, perhaps more importantly, there are very important outcome disparities uh, uh, from cancer in individuals living with HIV, and that's the topic for another day, but something that deserves an enormous amount of research both today and in the, and in the, years, uh, in the years to come. The prevalence of HIV infection across the globe, although it's really um, uh, less than 1% in the United States across Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southern Africa. Uh, it exceeds 10%. And in Uganda, uh, where we do research in Kampala, the prevalence of HIV infection in the adult population is about 8%. And as a result, we see a lot of HIV-associated malignancies at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Kampala. I focus on Africa but because for the rest of the 21st century, the vast majority of population growth that the planet sees will uh, occur on the African continent. Um, at this time, 2021, November, uh, the population of the African continent is about 1.4 billion, uh, not far behind the population of India and China, but it's predicted that by the end of this century, 2100, the population will triple to uh, 4.2 billion um, and the implications for for cancer control are enormous. And that's, uh, we'll talk more about that. 
Uh, more importantly, the predicted increase in cancer incidence um, will be most prominent in uh, countries in the uh, lowest tiers of the human development index. And um, in low HDI countries, we expect a 95% increase in the incidence of cancer just over the next 20 years, um, and a smaller but still enormous increase uh, in medium HDI countries. And so uh, the cancer incidence, inc uh, expected cancer incidence increase and the population increase have uh, uh, chilling implications for the future and are really the call to action for uh, November 2021. Another problem that we deal with is the fact that um, across the board, there uh, is limited, very limited total health expenditure for cancer care in most uh, low and middle income countries. And here in Sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, total health expenditure per capita on an annualized basis is less than $50. These are data um, shared with me by Joe Dielemans of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation uh, in Seattle. Obviously, it's very hard to buy much cancer uh, care, much less prevention uh, or palliation or survivorship uh, on 50, uh, less than $50 a head uh, per year. Compounding the problem is that um, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, African countries, there are very few trained oncology providers. And in fact, um, there are only uh, several dozen uh, trained oncology providers uh, in Uganda and mirroring the situation in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Radiotherapy resources in Sub-Saharan Africa are likewise uh, inadequate. Um, these data, you can look at the small kind of uh, yellow ochre circles here. Uh, which indicate the number of, of megavoltage radiotherapy units uh, per 1,000 cases across the African continent. The International Atomic Energy Agency recommends that there be at least one megavoltage unit uh, per 1,000 cancer cases. And um, uh, even uh, today, with an uh, enormous uh, increase in capacity over the, uh, that's been observed over the last 10 years, most sub-Saharan African countries fall far short of that benchmark uh, radiotherapy capacity measure. Um, when we speak about oncology drugs, I like to show uh, this slide as Dr. El Sadr uh, uh, um, shared with you. I uh, came out here to Seattle for my oncology fellowship in the previous millennium. And in the course of my professional career as an oncologist, uh, what I do, the practice of oncology has been truly revolutionized by a just um, a continuously accelerating um, uh, parade of discoveries and new drug developments that have transformed the practice of medical oncology. And I've just listed here um, some of the, uh, the flagship drugs that really um, that are examples of that remarkable transformation, beginning with the FDA approval of rituximab in 1997, which was arguably the first precision therapeutic for uh, cancer, and, and leading up to the development of Satoracid, which is a drug um, that the oncologists in the audience will know um, uh, was developed to treat what was thought to be um, heretofore an undruggable uh, very common cancer mutation, namely uh, mutations at the uh, residue 12 of the KRAS protein. Um, but uh, when we look how many of those drugs are available in sub-Saharan Africa, um, at least in, in Uganda, where, uh, where we're active, uh, only rituximab, imatinib, and trastuzumab, drugs for the treatment of, of lymphoma and a, uh, a type of leukemia called chronic myelogenous leukemia, and breast cancer are, are uh, what we might call reasonably readily available. And the rest of these um, wonder drugs that have transformed the practice of oncology really are not uh, readily available and, and demonstrating that um, there are uh, enormous shortages of drugs. We're basically 20 years behind uh, in Uganda compared with most of the Western world. Uganda is sometimes known as the Pearl of Africa. Uh, in 2021, its population is 47 million and it's growing very rapidly at 3.3% per year, uh, third fastest in the world. It has a land area about twice uh, that of Pennsylvania, slightly less than Oregon. 
The population is 16% urban and 84% rural, which is very important. Life expectancy at birth uh, currently is about 60 and 65 in males and females respectively. Uh, the GDP per capita in 2020 was about 1800 almost $1,900, uh, rank 174th in the world. And as I had mentioned to you several slides ago, the annual healthcare expenditure per capita is less than US uh, $50. 15% um, of the population has access to electricity and 79% have access to what we would uh, consider an improved water source. When you look at the Ugandan population structure, it has a decidedly uh, different um, uh, look than most high income countries. And as you can see, the Ugandan population pyramid demonstrates the, the youth bulge that is characteristic of most sub-Saharan African countries. Fully 32% of the country's population is below the age of 10, and 86% of the population is below the age of 40. That has enormous implications for, for cancer. The uh, cancers that we see in older populations, say in New York or Seattle, in individuals in their sixth, seventh, and eighth decades are relatively uncommon, whereas the malignancies that we see affecting individuals in their third, fourth, and fifth decades are, are really uh, the bread and butter. And so I uh, wanted to share with you these data from the uh, Global, Bur Global Burden of Disease Cancer Consortium published a few years ago that plot uh, on a global basis the incident mor and mortality of uh, cancers across the age spectrum. Um, looking just at mortality here, uh, between the ages of 20 and 50, you can see that the most common cancers are these four that I've indicated here on the right, namely liver cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and cervical cancer. So we don't see um, many of the cancers that are very common in, the, um, in older individuals that we might typically expect to see uh, in New York or Seattle. The effort that we um, support in Kampala, Uganda is a full collaboration with uh, an institution with a very storied history, namely the Uganda Cancer Institute, which was actually um, established in the 1960s uh, with help from the U.S. National Cancer Institute. Um, uh, and some of you may know that uh, it was there on the campus uh, of the UCI that John Ziegler, Ian McGrath, and Charles Olwini um, really uh, demonstrated for the first time the uh, cure of a disseminated pediatric malignancy, namely um, uh, advanced stage Burkitt lymphoma with intravenous chemotherapy. And uh, um, that was a remarkable achievement given the resources that were available in Uganda at the time. The mission of the Uganda Cancer Institute is to advance comprehensive cancer care for Ugandans through research, high quality evidence-based care, education, and training. And the Fred Hutch is very proud to collaborate and work with the Uganda Cancer Institute to pursue these objectives. And we do so in that building that I showed you at the beginning of the slide, this uh, Uganda Cancer Institute Fred Hutch Cancer Center. It's a 25,000 square foot facility opened in 2015 that features outpatient clinics, labs, and training facilities. Uh, the building houses are adult KS, gynecologic oncology, heme malignancy, and our pediatric outpatient clinics. Uh, the third floor is um, replete with a number of really state-of-the-art laboratories for specimen processing, biorepository. We have a BSL-2 lab, molecular diagnostics lab, histopathology, and believe it, we even have a next generation sequencing lab uh, with an aluminum uh, uh, sequencer. Uh, we're developing, uh, um, actively developing a laboratory capacity for pursuing studies in cancer and immunogenomics and more about those in the years to come. A major focus of the UCI Fed Hutch collaboration is the training of oncology providers. And um, by providers, I'm referring to both physicians and nurses as well as scientists. The cancers observed at the UCI um, are uh, slightly different than you might see at the Herbert uh, Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center or the Fred Hutch UW Comprehensive Cancer Center. The most common cancer we see there by far is cervical cancer. About 40 to 45% of those cases occur in HIV positive individuals and the balance occur in HIV negative individuals. Breast cancer is the second most common and 
Kaposi's sarcoma, head and neck, esophageal, uh, are uh, uh, not far behind Kaposi's sarcoma. And uh, sorry, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a, is a common uh, malignancy seen as well. These data um, convey an important point is that regardless of the cancer histology, there is a subset of patients seen at the Uganda Cancer Institute who in addition to their malignancy uh, have coexisting HIV infection, which uh, really permeates everything that we do. In 45 minutes, it would be impossible for me to really uh, describe the full breadth and depth of the research program that uh, we is currently um, active at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Suffice it to say that we think our research program really spans the entire cancer research spectrum from basic biology through prevention, excuse me, to detection and diagnosis, treatment, and public health uh, and, uh, and screening and epidemiology. And in the minutes to come, I'll just take the time to uh, discuss just a few of those research programs, but I'd, I'll only do so in a um, reasonably cursory fashion so as to leave most of the time uh, toward the end for questions. One of the unique malignancies that's uh, extremely common at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center is pediatric Burkitt lymphoma. Some of you may know that the pediatric Burkitt lymphoma was first described by Dennis Burkitt at Milago Hospital in Kampala, Uganda, which is just down the hill from the Fred Hutch UCI Cancer Center. And others of you may know that uh, its geographic distribution is, um, is very unique. It occurs uh, in equatorial regions of Africa and Southeast Asia, in which uh, there's a um, uh, holoendemic uh, malaria uh, transmission. And in fact, that's more uh, um, clearly demonstrated in this particular slide that shows you the distribution of holoendemic malaria in equatorial Africa and the distribution in which we typically see endemic Burkitt lymphoma. And that was one of Dennis Burkitt's initial observations from uh, the uh, late 1950s and the early 1960s. Burkitt lymphoma has a number of um, genetic and biological hallmarks. Uh, the first, of course, is the uh, presence in most cases of pediatric Burkitt lymphoma of Epstein-Barr virus. Indeed, Epstein-Barr virus was first identified by um, uh, doctors Epstein and Barr from a culture of Burkitt lymphoma cells that had been hand carried from Kampala, Uganda to uh, Middlesex Hospital Medical School uh, in the UK. The other uh, intriguing genetic characteristic of pediatric Burkitt lymphoma is a hallmark chromosomal translocation involving the MYC locus, the, the, the mother and father of all human oncogenes, uh, MYC, which is located on the long arm of chromosome two, uh, that uh, there are uh, three variant forms of this translocation, all of which put MYC under the influence of uh, promoter sequences, genetic regulatory sequences associated with immunoglobulin uh, uh, loci that then drive, drive high level expression of MYC in B cells and um, contributes uh, significantly to the pathogenesis of this malignancy. We also see, as you might imagine, a large uh, number of Kaposi's sarcoma cases in um, uh, Uganda. Um, in November of 2021, we don't see much KS in the US anymore thanks to the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy, um, but it remains a significant problem in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, Kaposi sarcoma in November of, of 2021 uh, remains the leading cause of cancer death in men in Uganda. Um, studying Kaposi sarcoma has been problematic. There are no preclinical or animal models. There are no bona fide really KS tumor cell lines. It's been difficult to uh, infect primary human cells with KSHV, otherwise known as human herpes virus 8. And um, our, our research program is really uh, uh, addressing uh, the challenge here that we, we need new approaches to study KS in vivo at the body, the tissue, cellular, and indeed the molecular levels. Uh, um, KS is associated with a very 
uh, common uh, human herpes virus. As I said, human herpes virus 8. And in fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, KSHV was first discovered uh, at Columbia University by this group of individuals in the early 1990s. Uh, it's a double-stranded circular uh, DNA virus with uh, the unique uh, portion of the genome of which is uh, about 140 KB encoding probably about 90 different open reading frames. HHV8 or KSHV is a gamma herpes virus. Its closest cousin in the herpes virus world is Epstein-Barr virus. Um, there are enormous similarities between HHV8 um, or KSHV and EBV. Um, like EBV, HHV8 uh, probably um, uh, infects individuals uh, uh, through uh, the oral cavity. It then disseminates to the blood and from there widely to tissues, particularly in the setting of HIV infection. Although 80 to 85 percent of the KS cases that we see in Kampala are associated with HIV infection, there's a significant um, incidence of what we call endemic KS, um, KS occurring in individuals who do not have demonstrable HIV infection. And that continues to be uh, an extremely common phenomenon, the reasons for which um, uh, remain unclear. Um, unlike EBV, um, which infects probably 98% of the global population, HHV8 seroprevalence is globally heterogeneous. Here in Seattle, KSHV or HHV8 seroprevalence is less than 10%. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's far higher. And in countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda, uh, as uh, well as Botswana, the seroprevalence exceeds 70%. Um, we have a prospective study of KS at the UCI Fed Hutch Cancer Center, which is the focus of uh, an intense clinical and laboratory um, research program. That uh, study has been um, championed and led uh, very ably by one of my colleagues, uh, Warren Phipps, um, who is based in Kampala and the medical director of the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. It's a prospective study that's been active for close to 10 years now where uh, subjects presenting into the UCI with KS um, undergo a number of pretreatment uh, procedures uh, they're then followed for uh, a year or more during which they receive standard treatment nowadays, which uh, consists is based primarily uh, on paclitaxel. Um, on site at the UCI Fred Hedge Cancer Center and back here in Seattle, we do a number of uh, very sophisticated uh, studies uh, uh, at the molecular level of the KS biopsies in the blood, the oral swabs, and the biospecimens that uh, this study generates, and um, this has been the source of uh, uh, enormous insight. And, and I hope that you can um, uh, hear directly from Dr. Phipps in the future uh, about this particular study. Um, there may be some of you in the audience who are familiar with his work, but it really is groundbreaking. And um, uh, it uh, is probably has even more promise for the future. Um, the second most common cancer seen at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center, as I told you, is breast cancer. And of course that uh, we don't think is associated uh, with any particular infection. Uh, one of the more exciting breast cancer studies uh, ongoing is uh, uh, ably led by Dr. Nixon Nianzima of the UCI and uh, the Fred Hutch's Manoj Manan. And it's funded by a $1.4 million award from GlaxoSmithKline through their African Non-Communicable Disease Open Lab Program. This study has three specific aims, one of which is to characterize the molecular portrait of women presenting with initial uh, breast cancer in Uganda. Um, uh, the second aim of which is to evaluate widely available molecular technology, including both PCR and a new product um, that can be uh, run on the Cepheid Gene Expert platform to do, improve the diagnosis. And um, a third clinical interventional aim to determine the feasibility of an all chemotherapy regimen, uh, all oral chemotherapy regimen for the treatment of locally advanced breast cancer among Ugandan women. And uh, I fully expect that um, as this uh, 
study has uh, completed accrual that you'll be hearing more about the results of the study from Drs. Nian, Ziema, and Manan in the future. Another important clinical trial that we have ongoing is a uh, trial of subcutaneous rituximab. I mentioned uh, uh, several minutes ago that rituximab is a uh, chimeric monoclonal uh, antibody first approved by the FDA in 1997 for the treatment of lymphoma to revolutionize the treatment of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I call it vitamin R, and there's rarely uh, a week where I don't administer it to uh, several patients. Uh, a problem, one of the problems uh, with this uh, um, admittedly wonderful drug is that IV administration is very challenging uh, in limited resource settings, precluding its widespread use. And so um, several years ago, we started uh, in collaboration and with support uh, from the manufacturer, a trial of subcutaneous rituximab at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Dr. Henry Dungu uh, is the uh, PI. This is our study team. And uh, we're uh, well into that study. There was a, a lull in activity during the pandemic about which I'll tell you uh, more in a few minutes, but it is back up to full speed. And um, the results so far have demonstrated that clearly subcutaneous rituximab uh, and, and the subcutaneous route for administration of of oncology therapeutics really could be a game changer in limited resource settings. One um, important area of research that has been uh, spearheaded by one of our um, uh, D43 PhD candidates, Margaret Nubuama, is a study um, identifying the bacterial causes of neutropenic fever among patients in Uganda. Um, there's a high rate of treatment related death uh, among patients. Uh, um, in uh, treated in low resource settings. Um, some fraction of that treatment related death is due to treatment related infections. Um, the empiric management of infections uh, in settings such as ours is complicated by emerging antimicrobial resistance and, and as yet um, poorly characterized resistance uh, uh, patterns and local epidemiology. Um, before the uh, onset the initiation of this trial, blood cultures were not available at the UCI, and Mar Maggie's PhD study uh, has, has it its, as its goal to identify bacterial causes of neutropenic fever among patients with heme malignancies. And she studied uh, an enormous number of both adults and children and um, uh, succeeded in uh, isolating a uh, large number of organisms, the further characterization of which has revealed some important findings, namely that expended here amongst the gram-negative isolates, exp uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase production uh, was already present in 64% of isolates. And so these uh, gram-negative bugs, unfortunately, are already resistant to most of the antibiotics that we uh, have at the UCI. Uh, carbapenem resistance uh, is less common but also detected in a significant fraction, 23% uh, in, in Maggie's data. So these have um, really important implications for the, the supportive care of patients with cancer in limited resource settings. And, and, uh, and I would offer for global uh, health security as well. It's not, uh, it, it, uh, uh, microbial um, resistant bugs can travel from Kampala to New York or Seattle and back. Uh, just as easily as uh, you and I can. And so that uh, it's very important on the gram positive side, uh, there's a high frequency of MRSA and vancomycin resistant enterococci. Um, both monomicrobial and polymicrobial um, isolates in Maggie's case series were associated with uh, very poor survival outcomes. And in fact, polymicrobial isolates are associated with um, greater than 50% uh, risk of death in the two weeks following um, the uh, febrile event that triggered uh, the acquisition of the blood cultures um, and uh, presents an enormous problem that we really need to deal with. Um, just briefly in the uh, few minutes that remain, I just wanted to talk about an area of um, uh, increasing present and uh, definitely um, uh, intense future research focus, and that's uh, cancer genomics and genomic data science in Africa which I've tried to uh, uh, suggest metaphorically uh, with this particular photo. Um, uh, those of you who are 
familiar with uh, current theories of um, uh, human demography, you know that anatomically modern humans first appeared on the African continent uh, several hundred thousand years ago and um, uh, had existed on the African continent and um, become genetically uh, reasonably isolated for hundreds of thousands of years before um, a small number of, uh, um, of Africans, of, of the forerunners of, of modern humans uh, left Africa, uh, an estimated 55 to 65,000 years ago. Um, those um, emigrants uh, widely populated the rest of the world in a very short time. But those emigrants um, 55 to 65,000 years ago carried with them only a tiny fraction of the genetic diversity that was present on the, that was already present on the African continent and had been developing over literally hundreds of thousands of years. And that has important uh, implications that I think was really first pointed out by uh, the Thousand Genomes Project data from which I'm illustrating here. Uh, first reported um, almost 10 years ago, the final study published in 2015, but this was a whole genome sequencing study of 26 populations uh, from around the world and looking at the genetic diversity uh, within the genomes of those individuals. There were about 2,500, not 1,000 genomes in the, final, uh, in the final study. There were six um, uh, African populations, and as you can see, the diversity in those African genomes was completely non-overlapping with the diversity in the uh, genomes identified in the 20 other groups studied. And um, much of that diversity was private to the African continent. And so there's an enormous amount of human genetic diversity that, uh, in fact, the vast majority of it um, exists on the African continent. It hasn't been studied. And of course, that genetic diversity will have enormous implications and, and um, uh, for both the development of disease and its treatment. And, and that really, I think, provides the rationale for uh, studying this. And what we hope to do is study that not here in Seattle, not in New York, but in Kampala um, uh, and across East Africa with our collaborators. Training is an important component of our activities at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Uh, we actually have an adult hematology oncology fellowship program that uh, the Fred Hutch and the University of Washington um, uh, sponsor and lead uh, in collaboration with the Uganda Cancer Institute. This oncology, hematology oncology training program was supported uh, by a generous award from the African Development uh, Bank uh, through a grant from the AFDB to the UCI to establish an East African Oncology Center of Excellence. The co-directors of that training program are Dr. Uh, uh, Abrahams Omading, uh, this uh, uh, wonderful individual here, and John Harlan from the University of Washington. Some of you may know John Harlan was the former chief of the Division of Hematology in the Department of Medicine at the UW. The objectives of this training program are to train physicians that will provide high level high quality clinical care, um, guide lower level health workers, conduct research in adult hematology, oncology, and perhaps most importantly, serve as mentors to the next generation of hematologists and oncologists. Uh, this program was launched in May, 2018, the first class of four fellows uh, illustrated here. We have Alex, Priscilla, uh, Joanna, and Innocent graduated in August of 2020 in the second class of three fellows, Eric and Bogare and Kenneth, uh, matriculated in November of 2020, and we hope we'll graduate in August of uh, 2022. Um, I would just add that uh, when the Fred Hutch began its collaboration with the UCI um, more than 15 years ago, there was one oncologist uh, or one trained oncologist in, in Uganda. There are now several dozen, and the, the, the Fred Hutch has participated in the training of, uh, has proudly participated in the training of more than half of those. And and, and we're very proud of that contribution. Training continues to be a really uh, very important focus of uh, Hutch activity at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. We have multiple NIH funded training grants, uh, current U54 and D43. Um, Dr. Phipps, uh, the medical director, uh, um, the, 
individual studying KS is really the, um, the champion of, and, and the prime mover in many of our training programs. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, is a resident of Uganda and based at the site. He uh, has a D43 award that's now in its current five-year uh, tenure um, focused on HIV-associated malignancies. Uh, we submitted a, um, a new D43 application focused on cancer genomics and genomic data science last summer that recently underwent scientific merit review and received a favorable INFAC score. Uh, we're hoping, crossing our fingers, uh, uh, that uh, it will be competitive for funding. We have a number of PhD trainees um, and uh, uh, trainees at various other levels. We've had great candidate retention. Uh, the sum um, total of our trainees uh, numbers over 300 um, over the course of our, uh, uh, of our collaboration with the UCI. We have an important peer mentoring career development program, 100 publications, uh, six trainees have received independent research awards, and, and many of these we think are uh, well, uh, well positioned to uh, obtain independent funding from the NIH, including K43 uh, awards. We have an oncology nursing training program. This is perhaps uh, one of the uh, most, uh, the, the activities that, uh, of which uh, I'm most proud and, uh, and which I believe in the most. And, I'm an oncologist, um, but I'll be the first to admit that oncologists are a dime a dozen in my book and, and uh, oncology uh, nurses are worth their weight in any precious metal that you can name. Um, we have an oncology nursing tr training program that's co-led by uh, Dr. Kathleen Shannon Dorsey, a nurse educator at the UW Fred Hutchinson Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, uh, uh, another nurse, nurse educator, Arliss Kumar, and then uh, several uh, nurses at the UCI, including Alan Mala and Agnes Sagawa. Um, they've made, uh, Arliss and Kathleen have made over six trips to Uganda. They've uh, delivered training sessions to more than 80% of the UCI nursing staff. They've hosted UCI nurse leaders here in Seattle and are actively, even despite the pandemic, um, uh, working on uh, the really developing oncology nursing capacity. The last thing I really want to talk about in um, no more than a couple of minutes is the impact of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, which uh, as everywhere else on the globe has been profound. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has traced a, unique, uh, a very unique trajectory uh, in Africa. If you look at in aggregate the cases um, reported in the 54 countries of the African continent over the course of the pandemic, there have been three major waves. But if you look at individual country level data, you can see that there's far more granularity to that. Kenya, immediately adjacent Uganda to the east, has experienced four major waves. Um, Uganda, only two. Um, Early on in the pandemic, the Uganda National Council for Science and Technology uh, requested that we shut down all research activity at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And so we did um, essentially no research between March and um, August, September of uh, 2020. And uh, uh, at that time with uh, the establishment and implementation of risk management plans, and in particular, uh, the capability to uh, test for SARS-CoV-2 infection by PCR, we were able to uh, restart our, our uh, research program. Um, we have a wonderful group of individuals that um, we trained uh, to uh, 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 carry out SARS-CoV-2 testing uh, by Zoom. Um, I have to thank Dr. Uh, Andrea Tallerton, who's our laboratory director at the UCI Fred Hedge Cancer Center for having done that. Uh, Andrea really spends most of her time in Uganda, but uh, was caught uh, in Seattle at the time the uh, pandemic broke out and from 8,800 miles, 11 time zones away, helped this group, this wonderful group of lab people to establish a capability that were absolutely critical to um, our being able to uh, keep research going. You can see here in our testing statistics, the two major waves, of SARS-CoV-2 observed in Uganda. One just about uh, a year ago, and then a far uh, more important one that occurred in May, June, July of 2021. Um, 
The prospects for the pandemic in Africa remain uncertain. These are data from Our World and Data. Um, just taken a few days ago across the African continent and the 54 countries, um, there isn't a single country with really more than, except with the exception perhaps of Morocco, with more than 10% uh, uh, vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. Um, the reasons for that are complex, but um, the one obvious um, implication is that we will be dealing with SARS-CoV-2 in Africa uh, for many months and potentially even years to come. Um, the probably one of the most devastating impacts, and this is my last slide um, of the pandemic, has been the fact that it has prompted the government to close schools now um, for 21 consecutive months. That's the longest school closure um, on the globe. And in fact, uh, this is an article that I just took from the New York Times um, last Thursday, Veterans Day, in that uh, 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 reported that uh, nearly a third of Ugandan students may never return to school. And I think um, the impact of the pandemic on um, the population, the economy, and the social structure um, in the long run may be um, its most devastating impact, which is uh, unfortunate. So just to summarize and to uh, uh, really uh, transition to questions, I uh, wanted to point out that cancer incidents in Sub-Saharan Africa will increase steadily and significantly over the balance of this century. Existing resources, both human and material for cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment, palliation, and survivorship are in Sub-Saharan Africa are already inadequate to meet the current need. Investment now in capacity building for the growing cancer burden is urgently needed to meet the current and future challenges. And, um, and um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the Fred Hutch has made a long-term commitment to help build capacity to meet the future cancer burden. And we are very interested uh, in looking for partners in this mission. And uh, it's uh, um, um, my great um, thanks to the ICAP and, and the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center for allowing me to, to introduce our program and hope that perhaps uh, Columbia and the Fred Hutch uh, could collaborate in the future. Um, I leave you with one thought. Um, this uh, is a picture of my hero. Um, this is Norman Borlaug, probably the most important person of the uh, 20th century that no one's ever heard about. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Uh, he's an agronomist uh, commonly referred to as the father of the Green Revolution. Um, but he spent most of his life working outside of Mexico City, uh, um, developing high yield drought resistant, pest resistant strains of grain to feed the world, um, widely um, credited with having averted famine for hundreds of millions of people in the 60s and 70s. Uh, obviously the, the impact of what we're trying to do is not gonna be as great, but um, the way in which we're trying to do it by uh, um, um, working uh, in Kampala locally to develop capacity um, is our hope. And, and uh, with that, I'll uh, just thank the many, many people that really make the uh, UCI Fred Hutch collaboration, what it is, and our Fred Hutch Global Ecology, and uh, take questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Warren. And um, if you can please uh, just stop sharing. Wonderful. Great to see you. And thank you for really a, a comprehensive presentation, but also an inspiring one. Um, as, as you said, um, this is, uh, these are challenges that um, the continent is facing today and also will be uh, greatly magnified in the future based on the data you just showed us in terms of the, uh, the anticipated increase in incidence of cancer over the upcoming years. Um, so I'll start with a couple of questions and then you know, also include some of the questions we have in the Q&A &A as well. It seems to me when, you know, the, as you pointed out that the anticipated increase in cancer incidence as we move forward, Kind of inspires one to think about prevention. You know, obviously that's very critical. And I'm wondering your thoughts in terms of, you know, what are your thoughts in terms of activities that can get at trying to prevent uh, cancer uh, in the future, variety of different cancers in the future. I'm thinking, of course, of the influence of um, HPV for cervical cancer, HIV, et cetera. And, um, and how have you worked within Uganda itself to influence policies 
or have you worked to influence policies regarding some potential prevention interventions? Yeah, thanks for that question, Dr. El Sadr. So, um, I, uh, both that question and a couple of the questions in the, the Q and A, um, clearly prevention is one of the um, most important uh, interventions that we that will have an impact and will help us meet the the, the needs and the challenges uh, that we'll see over the balance of the current century. We have a very active uh, program in cervical cancer screening, and that's been a particular focus of research. That's uh, a lot of that's been done uh, in collaboration with colleagues at Seattle Children's Hospital, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Lisa Frankel and Dr. Corey Casper from the Infectious Disease Research Institute uh, in Seattle. Um, uh, one research project that we did screened over 12,000 women and identified new subtypes of HPV associated with uh, uh, pre-malignant lesions in, uh, in women. Um, the, one of the interventions that would have an enormous impact would be HPV vaccination, which mm -hmm. generally um, yes. uh, is not um, possible right at the moment uh, in Uganda or Sub-Saharan Africa because it's prohibitively expensive. Hepatitis B vaccination, which is very effective in preventing hepatitis B associated liver cancer, which is very common. Um, is, um, is more widely uh, available, but it's not done at birth. It's done um, uh, later on in life. And so uh, we do think that vaccination against the infection-related cancers is, um, as far as low-hanging fruit goes, one of the areas where we can have obvious and enormous impact, um, even in the short term. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems to me that that's, I mean, we see this obviously in our own work is that often in order to, you know, create the change, the magnitude of change that we're seeking is that there needs to be kind of a, a commitment, a political commitment and, and leadership in a way so that all of these interventions can become part of the embedded kind of in the health system overall. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that certainly the experience from HIV um, has taught us that unless and until we're able to Kind of be able to make this the norm across the health system it it unfortunately will uh, will delay the desired impact of uh, vaccines and so on and unfortunately one of um, one of the um, consequences of the pandemic has been the uh, has been a negative impact on just routine childhood immunization which right. has uh, been seen globally and uh, we have yet to um, see the cost that that will incur, but uh, we need to be prepared for it now and be taking action to correct that. You know, the, another question is that, um, uh, is that in, in our experience also is that often um, a presentation with cancer in many uh, settings in Sub-Saharan Africa is in very is in late stage um, cancer rather than kind of earlier stage cancers, which obviously has an impact in terms of response to treatment and outcomes and so on. And I'm just curious about, um, you mentioned the screening for cervical cancer, that's obviously very important to identify early lesions, but have you been, uh, have you thought about, or are you engaged in sort of other kinds of uh, trainings for um, healthcare providers to detect um, uh, early, uh, like breast cancer, breast exams and so on, some of the, the norms of practice that, that can influence uh, and hopefully lead to early diagnosis of cancers? Yeah, I think uh, that's an, an incredibly good question, Dr. El Sadr. Um, we, uh, as oncologists um, here in um, a high income country such as the US, we, uh, we take all of the expensive infrastructure and human resources and trained human resources that it takes to diagnose cancer for granted. But uh, generally speaking, those human and material resources are not available. Uh, in uh, low incomes and, and low resource settings. Um, it, um, the major malignancies, epithelial malignancies that uh, comprise, a, account for a large part of the world's cancer burden um, are typically diagnosed by trained individuals who have um, expensive fiber optic scopes that they can uh, insert through some body orifice, snake to some part, um, some uh, deep internal part of the body, take a snippet, a little biopsy, and then uh, retrieve that biopsy and send it to the lab for diagnosis. And um, by that, I'm referring to colon cancer and esophageal yeah. cancer, gastric cancer, lung cancer. 
Um, generally speaking, that that human uh, uh, that human workforce and the infrastructure needed to do that are not available and probably won't be. And right. so a major focus is on the development of, of uh, uh, basically molecular diagnostics based, based on the analysis of tumor derived molecules in the plasma fraction of blood that will be able to make these diagnoses mm -hmm. far earlier than um, we otherwise would. Yeah. And I'm do wondering, you know, kind of, you know, you mentioned the importance of nurses, and I'm, I agree with you completely. They're a precious uh, uh, a cadre of providers, but I do wonder about the feasibility of um, of utilizing primary providers, whether it be uh, clinical officers or, phys or or clinicians or nurses, in just even being able to identify early symptoms that could lead to you know, further diagnostics. And uh, because that's kind of more likely to hopefully be able to bring these kinds of, of knowledge to the broader, uh, I'm thinking of Uganda and health centers and district hospitals and so on, and might be at least an interim step until we have all those more sophisticated tools available. How, what are your thoughts about that uh, approach? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, a great, question. Um, we, we use um, online training tools um, a great deal. Uh, the pandemic has very much accelerated that. Uh, for the last six years, uh, I've led an online uh, international virtual tumor board uh, weekly that focuses on heme malignancy. So every night, at, every Wednesday night at 9 or 10 p.m., we get together mm -hmm. And uh, from uh, several continents, so we discuss the diagnosis and management of cases. And so there's enormous potential for that that we've really just begun uh, to tap, but really um, uh, uh, look forward to making uh, greater use of that in the future. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. That's really heartening. Uh, and maybe again, uh, I'm just looking at the hour. One last question is, uh, Looking ahead, I mean, where do you see um, the breakthroughs in the context of a country like Uganda? You know, what what do you think will be will be the maybe the one or two activities or interventions that will make the big difference that we're all looking for? Yeah, I I I do think, Dr. Al Sadr, that uh, ultimately understanding the the pathogenesis that will generate insights as to prevention mm -hmm. um, is the area uh, to which I look for the, the greatest impact. And I just um, I, I wanted to uh, respond to a comment in the chat from Dr. Joe Dina Dominguez of the Office of HIV um, Malignancies at NIH, and uh, Dr. Dominguez asked about. Uh, uh, trying to bring together other insti U.S. institutions mm -hmm. that uh, yep. are engaged in Africa. And uh, Dr. Dominguez, you're absolutely right. And um, it is my absolute uh, goal and mission to, um, and one of the reasons I'm presenting here today to bring together Columbia University and Fred Hutch and the University of North Carolina and the University of uh, uh, California at San Francisco and the University of Pennsylvania and LSU um, uh, in Baton Rouge together, all of us have significant commitments and working together will get far more done faster than working individually. So thank you for making that point. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. And I think we could coming together, we could kind of develop a prior, maybe a prioritized agenda um, uh, that we can kind of get to consensus on in terms of the, those most critical next steps. Uh, maybe you, I will take one last question, uh, if you have time, sure. uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a question by uh, Dr. Kuzik is that what are the prospects for um, sampling, uh, you know, at, at distal facilities, the health centers and so on, particularly uh, fine needle aspirates and so on? Right. So Dr. Kuzik um, asked uh, uh, two questions, one of which was educating rural mm -hmm. care providers to the signs and symptoms of malignancy. And then uh, talks about um, uh, getting samples from uh, uh, outlying districts. So I pointed out 16% of the population is urban, 84% rural. And the UCI um, is uh, directly and actively addressing that by setting up uh, at least four and hopefully five in the long-term satellite centers at, um, in the uh, outer districts of Uganda 
that will um, facilitate education about cancer as a disease and its symptoms, and will make possible the diagnoses of individuals with cancer in these districts um, will facilitate and uh, help us um, make better use of centralized capacity, say, in the capital. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Cusick, for both of those questions. They were great. And it, it's kind of, there are so many, I always say there's so many, uh, I mean, that cancer is a chronic condition and HIV is a chronic condition. And there are lots of lessons learned from the scale up of HIV programs that I think um, uh, can, can really serve us all well as a community as we try to tackle a cancer um, moving forward. And I think particularly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I want to end by thanking you. This was really a wonderful presentation, a lot of food for thought, a lot of opportunities for collaborations moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to also thank uh, all of you who have joined us today and, uh, and welcome you to uh, our ICAP uh, Grand Round series. You'll be receiving updates on uh, when those are announced and uh, uh, hopefully we will see you there. Have a good day, everyone, and all the best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. El Sadr and Dr. Nugut.